what was, I guess, the motivation behind the creation of the SNU? Why? Why? Yeah. What did they know? They knew about the SIDS rates. I think nobody talks about this. It's really ugly. It's morose. We've been out for over, over seven years. The kind of press we've gotten, there is no PR better than ours. And it's not because I'm congratulating myself. I think that I can only do so much as a marketer. I think it's really about how good the product is and how helpful it is, right? Like, think about it as a woman. Like, if you find the best mascara, you tell everyone. That's you right. gift it to people. Like, you are the evangelist and you are, like, patient zero of that mascara. Right. But now imagine that it was baby sleep, right? That you could get one or two more hours per night, every night when you're exhausted. Oh, yeah. And you don't have a night nurse. And you and I lived alone in New York when our right. family was in L.A. and you know, it was a lot going on um, during the pandemic and everything else. And so you're able to get people more sleep. You're able to get peace of mind that right. they're like safely on the back. I remember I called my mom crying one day and I was like, I keep checking to see if she's alive all the time. How did you do this before? And she said, we didn't. We just stared at you. At one point in like the 80s, people would put a mirror up to the baby and see like, like if the, it was the, fogging, yeah. like if they were alive. I don't blame them because you don't know. You just keep staring. Yeah. And so I was like really stressed out, like, God, if I didn't have this, I wouldn't sleep at all. Right. Because it wasn't about like, I hate that sentence, like sleep when the baby sleeps. Like It was so hard for me to do that. Also, like, I'm not narcoleptic. It's 2 p.m. I have circadian rhythm. I'm not going to sleep. <laughs> so then I may as well like watch Netflix or right. work or something. But I'm not going to like go to sleep right now because I wanted to have some fun or right. relaxing or whatever. And so I think like if you can do that for somebody, it's going to change everything. I mean, and so I think, you know, kind of back to your question, why they did it was to help. But but how or the rewind of why is actually also the best story. The abridged version is um, Harvey was on book tours because the happiest baby on the block was like, you know, number one parenting book. And my mom's video that she made out of it was like, I'll never forget old fashioned press kits were printed and put in a folder and like mailed out to people. Wow. And so like I would print out the Amazon um, listing as like part of our press kit because it was Casino Royale, Happiest <laughs> Baby and Harry Potter. So these wow. were like top DVD sales amongst like wow. Hollywood <laughs> films. Um, and so they had figured out how to help people, but you can only teach so much, speak so much. Right. And what they found, there was some data that showed just correlation um, that – you know, sometimes pacifiers, babies who use pacifiers, um, there might be some kind of correlation there with their, with SIDS, like a reduction, like a positive correlation. There was something else about babies who were swaddled mm -hmm. and how that might also be, we don't know, so I can't say the word beneficial, mm -hmm. but um, but there was a correlation that demonstrated that there was perhaps a benefit to swaddling and, and a reduction of the risk of SIDS. So he would tour all the time giving these speeches and talking about how apropos now, so kind of funny to say, but his real words were 3,600 babies in America alone die every year. I want to mm. like mm. take a pause. That is 9-11 that is numbers. These are big numbers. We for many, many years are still reading these people's names on from 9-11 and that's happening to American babies every year, year after year for decades. And there was really nothing anyone could do about it. And so he would talk about educating people about a safe sleep space and about the five S's, which was from his book, which was swaddling, you know, shushing, sucking, and these things that could could perhaps be beneficial. Um, and then at the time, someone heckled him at a conference, and he had retired from pediatric care as a clinician, as a doctor, and was just doing his books and, and speaking. And so a heckler in the audience goes, you're a famous carp. You fix it. Like, yeah, fix SIDS. Okay. But they went to dinner. And he doodled it and on a napkin, which I recently found. I was wow. asking my mom. I was like, find the napkin, find the napkin. And we recently found it. And he doodled it. And it looks like almost identical to what Snoo looks like. And he was like, I said to my mom, like, are you in? Are you going to help me do this? And she was like, yeah. Naively thinking. They were like, it'll take a year. It took them five and a half years before we launched. This was very robustly studied, very serious engineers, serious testing, and that's when I knew that I was way wrong because then they made a few prototypes mm -hmm. and then they would give it to the MIT Media Labs engineers, like PhD students and stuff, and they would disappear when it was time that their time with our prototype was over. They would like stop answering texts and calls or finally when we'd like get in touch with them, 
they'd be like, you can't take it back. Like this saved our marriage. Like we'll give you our life savings. And we were like, we want to help you, but like we have to give it to another family. We, we tested it in 400 homes before wow. we launched on top of all of the rigorous safety testing, government certifications and sure. everything else. So it was like wild. Then I was like, oh, he's onto something. But it was from a heckler. It was like a guy said, you fix it. Like It's like saying to somebody, you cure cancer. It's crazy. Right. And then he like doodled it. And and I remember actually, if I'm really telling the dirty truth, there was like an idea. He had like a, he had like cut and put like mattress foam stuff into a laundry basket. Like this is how much it was like his brainchild at home. Wow. So when you went to market with it, how do you describe the snoo, like someone's like, wait, what is this? Like, what is a snoo? That's a good question. It's, um, I just say back, like it's a robotic baby bed that keeps them on their backs with like an organic cotton five second swaddle, like a sleep sack. And the sack clips into the bed and right. prevents dangerous rolling. It's a big ass mouthful, but you have a lot of education around the product, right? And then I also say it's, um, it's kind of like an external womb. It simulates right. the womb. It has like soothing sound and motion. Right. And then the other thing I say all the time is it responds like you would, right? So one of the things people kind of take for granted when we are explaining all of this at once, we say it's automatic, it's responsive, and it goes like over someone's head because what does that mean? But when I say the bed responds to your individual child's needs. Right. Like it'll give yep. a different sound and motion. Our special algorithm will serve your child what it needs. And then I like would bend in at like a conference. I'd bend into the bed and like yell to fake cry. And then people, they would see that the bed would respond, respond to me. To mm -hmm. Then they were like, oh my God. So it's really incredible. And that's, I think, why it's so exciting too to have this new FDA um, de novo authorization because everybody who's tried it loves it. Mm -hmm. And at this point, like the whole internet has used it, I feel. Right. <laughs> there's there's no one alive almost who doesn't know what's new is. But of course everyone, you know, every niche and genre will have like a skeptic. And so it feels really good to now have the FDA, you know, stand behind us and say, we believe that this can safely keep babies on their backs. And that's the most important way to protect your child from suicide. How do you convince someone who's just you know, more traditional, we'll say, right? And they're just like, what? A robotic crib? What? I don't yeah. get it. No. I mean, everybody has haters, right? right? So <laughs> so they say like, hold your baby. And I'm like, it's not the same. We're not replacing a parent. You'll never replace never. the parent. And look, like it's going to calm crying. It's going to kind of connect sleep cycles. So right. like if they were just a little fussy and like wanted a little something, Snoo will soothe them. The other thing I say is, did your mom ever come over? Did she ever hold your baby so you could lie down for five minutes or an hour or take a shower or right. eat? And then they go, oh, okay. I was actually at the annual conference, the American Academy of Pediatrics this year, like a month ago or something. And this woman like beelined for us. And I was like, oh, here comes trouble. And right. she sounded very challenging. And she said like, well, what do you say to the people who say, so I didn't know if it was her or not, but to the people who say that you're like encouraging people are almost negligent and replacing their parenting. And I said, I lived alone in New York. The first time I was actually home alone in the apartment for the day, my parents had flown back to LA. My husband had gone to work and I was like home alone Oh man! with my baby. I had to pee and I <sighs> was naive. You think like, I don't know, boys can pee with one hand. Maybe I was stupid, right. but I held her. I went to the bathroom and I thought I could like unbuckle my pants and pull your pants down. No, you cannot pull your pants down with one hand. <laughs> and then I looked around and I like, didn't know where to put her because I was – she was so delicate. Maybe if I had a second kid, I'd be like, you can go on the bathroom floor. It right. doesn't matter. But as like a clean freak and germaphobe, I was like, that's gross. So I looked around and like I couldn't put her on the sofa because you were afraid they could roll off and you're going to leave. Oh, so then I right. go like look around for a second and I was like, snoo. So I went to my bedroom and I put her in the snoo and I zipped her in and I turned it on. And I knew that even though she was awake and I wasn't using it for sleep, I was using it as a spare set of hands. Right. I was using it because I was alone and it was like my co-parent at that right. moment. And then I went pee and I came back and she was fine. And I was like, oh, no one told me, like, what do you do if you have to pee? It, it sounds silly and maybe it but is. It's so but so true. I didn't know. And so I think when I said to this woman the story – and I said, I live alone in New York and I don't have a night nurse and I don't have family. And the nanny only comes, you know, from eight to six. Right. And I have no other help. And my husband as a professor sometimes has a night class from six to nine thirty. 
I also deserve to lie down for five minutes and to not be scared that she's going to roll over. Right. And the woman like looks at me and I thought she was going to ref- refute or rebuttal or something. Mm-hmm. And she goes, and it was the best moment because she was like a pediatrician and buttoned up with like a blazer. And she goes, it's f- brutal. <laughs> And I was like, there it is. So I think when you appeal to the humanity and you remind them that this is the first time in history. Look, we used to culturally have like a hundred nannies. We had the neighbors, your grandma, your aunties, Mm -hmm. your sister, your friends. Like we had a community. We had the village. Where is the village? The village is gone. Right. And so reminding that person, like I just needed five seconds um, and reminding her of perhaps her personal experience. Like she opened up. (laughs) 